Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. No, that's definitely not true. Okay, let's start, start with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that you give us, for the way that you work in our lives, the things that you do in us and through us. We trust that today as we continue to look at your Word, that that would bring you glory, and through looking at your Word, we would come a little closer to you understanding you a little bit better and relating to you a little bit better. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us to be your children. Okay, we're in... Uh, my phone can stop doing that. Anyhow. There we go. Special revelation this morning. Thank you, Michael. Michael Lockstampour, the pastor in Ocala, just said he's praying. Late today. He normally does that before seven. Linda will take a caravan, a, a truck load, and a caravan load over to our house between services. Should you need so, I have still yet not been able to, still yet not been able to get a hold of the property manager. But what's interesting is they were here last night because they moved their trucks and stuff. They do that for us so that they don't take up space, but they haven't gotten the word yet. Yeah, they're they're aware, and as soon as they come in the morning, they'll have the same issue. Because the last time they told us before we knew, um, because they'd gone into their unit and it didn't work. Well. The last time they they scoped the, the the line all the way through and and solved the problem. So I don't, I don't. That's the problem of not owning your place. There are lots of benefits to not owning your place, but that's the problem. Okay, you keep thinking that way. <laughs> okay. Yeah, special revelation. Yeah, you see. Well, we may get as far as the question of the uh, part of the discussion in special revelation is theophany. Anne asked an interesting question after the end of the movie last night. Was that a Christophany or was that an angel? And it was probably three o'clock this morning or so that I thought, well, it couldn't be a Christophany in any case, because what's the definition of a Christophany? Right, exactly. So if it was Jesus, then it would be a, a, an, an appearance of the resurrected Jesus, or it would be an angel. I don't know. That just adds a new wrinkle to it. No, because we know he did at least twice after his ascension. To Paul, and then to uh, Cornelius. So... Yeah, no, I'm not sorry, not in the story of Cornelius to Peter. So, and there's no statement anywhere that says Jesus won't be on the earth. We know that he was able to, to do that. So, I, right, it, yeah, yeah. An angel, I think, provides us a little less theological issues in, from the movie last night. Um, but I don't think the issues, I don't think there are significant issues to it being also Jesus. 
But what we need to remember is it was a uh, fictional story. <laughs> although, although Steve pointed out that he looked it up and he saw that it was was uh, written after a true event. So I guess I need to do a little more research on the event. But anyway, we're talking about special revelation now. We we began by looking at uh, the, the reality that God exists, and and uh, there is certainly evidence to that. I think impossible to look at creation and not agree that something exists. You, you've heard me say that before that I, I appreciate the um, intelligent design movement for this reason. They acknowledge and allow the world to acknowledge a creator without necessarily being theist and deist. Um, and, and I think that's a step in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's important for us to, to, to think of. We need to be able to defend what we believe and recognize that the world doesn't use the same tools that we do. So if we can defend... This is going to sound wrong, but if we can defend God and in, in the Bible without using our tools, but using their tools, then we've we've done a very good apologetic work. I don't mean to say that God needs our defense. That's not what I'm trying to say. So we, we've been looking at uh, general revelation and how God's revealed himself in general revelation. And now, uh, really? I'm just going to keep doing that, are you? Our remote control is broke. So I'm to use uh, God's revealed Himself in general revelation. You you look at the uh, you look at the uh, pictures of sunsets, or you go to the mountains, or you you go to the beach, or whatever. It's very clear God exists. He's revealed that in general revelation. the The first thing that uh, that we looked at under general revelation, like in Psalm 19:1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. I, I don't know how you look at creation and you don't conclude God. Uh, you know, when I look at a at a fantastic uh, building, I don't assume that it just happened. If it had just happened, it would look like the building in Surfside. It wouldn't look like a fantastic building. We all, we all admit that things that have structure appear to be created, which requires there to be a creator. To think that all of, all of the universe happened by accident is foolish. Psalm 14.1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they do abominable deeds, there is none who does good. I think that's pretty clear. It's pretty foolish. The second form of general revelation is natural law or the conscience. We talked about that a lot recently. God has made man in his image, and in making man in his image, it doesn't mean God looks like this. It means that I look like God from a functional, societal, conscious, conscience point. God made us to have relationships. God existed eternally in a triune Godhead of relationships. And so we're, we look like Him in those relationships. We look like Him in our conscience, knowing, sort of knowing right from wrong. Romans 1.29 they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, and covetousness, and malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, uh, maliciousness. They are gossip. Because the world is full of that evil, we are suppressing the reality of God. What other evidence is the test to the existence of God? And in this lesson, we're going to look at some special revelation. 
whereas general revelation is available to all people generally, specifically or special revelation is available to specific people at specific times and at specific places. We will all be we will be looking at six primary ways which God has chosen to reveal himself to us. The first one is angel. Now last night in the in the movie, David appeared to be an angel, messenger of God, sent by God to do a specific work in a specific way. Have you ever thought about angels? There's a there's a, a, a movement within the broader Christian world to worship angels and to to consider angels to be more than they are. At what rank are angels in God's hierarchical structure? You want to stick with that answer? Didn't, didn't God make Jesus to be a little lower than the angels? Hmm? When he became man? Okay, but didn't, isn't that what we're told? In God's hierarchical structure of, of created beings, angels are below us. No, I, I said that backwards, sorry. Made angels to be below us. Man, no, above us. Oh, I'm just, yeah, I'm confused. <laughs> I confused my own self. Let's just go on and we'll, we'll cover this. Holy cow. Maybe I should start sleeping and not drinking decaf. If I find out this is decaf, I'm on the warp. What are angels? Okay, but they're more, right? They don't just give messages. They do other things, right? What do they do? Okay, the army of God. Which means they do what? Okay. Okay, that's a good answer. They do whatever God tells them to do. We've seen them in, in Scripture. We've seen them do all sorts of things, right? Remember, there's some angels that come with some great big swords and and do some some sword chopping and killing people. So you know they they are they are God's appointed representatives that bring messages in various forms. Help. Oh, yep. Perfect example. If if the angel, or if the movie last night was an angel, he's bringing a message, but he's also helping and doing things, conveying God's uh, um, healing and so forth. They are they are assigned to be ministers to the saints. Hebrews one fourteen, and they are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who. Inherit salvation. Angels are spirits sent from God to minister to those who are saved. Since they are spirits, they typically can't be seen unless God chooses to reveal them or chooses to put them into some kind of physical form. As we've seen in the Old Testament frequently, God sends a, an angel that looks like a man. Yeah, angel army. 1 Corinthians 11.10, this is, uh, that is why a wife ought to have a, wait, that's not the right one. Oh, that is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Here, huh? I'm about to. Here, here he calls a woman to wear a, a sign of authority over uh, over their heads so that they will not lose the ministry of angels. It seems that wives were disrespecting husbands by taking off their head covering, which then keeps them from receiving angelic ministry. One of the things that, that we have at 
play in God's creation is a is a dialogue of sorts between the angelic world and the human world. We do a lot of things on for the angels, for, for the sake of the angels, and the angels do a lot of stuff for us. So we have this kind of back and forth. Can angels be saved? Well, one third of them fell. Yeah, I'm going to answer the question by saying, I don't know, because Scripture doesn't talk about that. It talks about them falling when Satan rebelled. He took a third of the angels with him. We call them what? Demons. And so, does God redeem them? We have nothing in Scripture that talks about that. We do have in Scripture God already having imprisoned some of them permanently. Jude talks about that, and I think that's a reference to the angels of Genesis 6 that cohabitated with human women and created a, a, an angel-man sub-race called Nephilim. Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4. Jude tells us that God's already, I believe, I believe Jude is talking about those angels, already put them into, into prison wherever, whatever, however you want to interpret that, already permanently. So I would argue they for sure can't be redeemed, but we don't know about the others. Okay, yeah. The, the proof of their redemption would be that they're living the right life, not that they live the right life to be saved. Right. And we just don't know. How many angels are there? We don't know. We don't know a total number. We know a total, we know, we know a, uh, a percentage of the ones that fell, but we don't know what the total is, so we don't know how many demons there are, and we don't know how many angels there are. When were angels created? I, I agree, that's what I assume as well, but the vast majority of evangelical Christians believe that they were created prior to that. Because, which, which causes some problems in your interpretation of creation, uh, but God says that they witnessed creation. <laughs> so, how would it be possible for the angels to witness creation? They were, they or they were created first. Yeah. So, the, and that's my theory that God created them very first. You know, on day one, the first thing on day one, and then they are already beings that can understand and see and witness the rest of creation. In Genesis 19, we have the story of Lot. What happens in Lot? What, do, what characters do we see entering into the scene in Genesis 19 in Lot? Yeah, the sword-wielding angel. The ninja angel, I call him. Yeah. You know, big, strong, tough guys Long swords able to go in and yeah, that's what we're talking about. That's exactly what we're talking about. Yep. And so angels are created as spirits, but God gives them the ability to take on other forms. Some argue that um, just the name popped right out of my head. Just as I was about to say it. Walking along with the donkey that talked to him. Balaam, thank you. That Balaam's donkey was an angel. Don't know? 
you know, God uses them in different ways, is the point. Genesis 18, um, discussion of Abraham and Lot. Remember, Abraham had a discussion about uh, moving forward. They watched God move and intervene to save the elect, the ones that God had chosen. We also saw a special revelation of angels with Elisha in 2 Kings 6. In this narrative, King uh, Aram's armies were surrounding the house of Elisha while he and his servant were waiting inside. The servant was fearful, so Elisha prayed for God to open the eyes of his servant, and his eyes were awakened to a special revelation. He saw surrounding the camp with horses and chariots of fire to protect them. Angel. I, I've said frequently, I'm glad most of the time that God keeps the separation between the spiritual world and the physical world um, the curtains drawn because I think we would be afraid. I know I would be afraid if I could see what's happening around us now. I'm glad I don't. But a lot of people want to see into that and think that will be pretty cool. I think it will be pretty terrifying. You know, the forces of evil at work around you and how angels are protecting you. This may seem unique, but the Bible teaches that angels are always protecting us. Psalm, oh, we're in the section on angels protection, by the way. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, Psalm uh, 91, uh, 91.1. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. God is protecting us. He has around us angels that are doing that. We know from the book of Daniel, we'll come to that in a little bit, but we know from the book of Daniel that countries have been assigned angels. Many believe that people have been assigned angels. We call them our guardian angels. I know that in my life experiences, my guardian angel, if I have one, would have to wear a seatbelt. I've been in some pretty hairy situations where it's only for the fact that God protected me that I'm alive. Matthew 18.10 See that you not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Gives us a little hint. Jesus is talking about little kids. They're angels, he says. One of the ways that we, one of the verses that we use to develop the concept that we've been assigned protection. Throughout church history, because of, of verses like this, there has been this understanding of guardian angels. I'll admit right now, I, I, I believe that God protects us all the time. Did he assign me an angel at, at birth or at conception? I don't know. There's not enough definitive evidence to say categorically, yeah, there are guardian angels. Jesus here talks about kids having angels to protect them. Are they specific angels assigned to that specific child for the rest of their life? I don't know. I know my God's able to do that, but I just I don't have the the evidence in Scripture to categorically say that's what he does. If I do have a, an angel assigned to me, and he's the same guy that's been with me now for 63 years, I owe him a lot. Because in, in my life, there have been times where I should be dead. People have tried to kill me. And so, I, uh, I owe him. i got to take him out for a beer or something. Oh yeah, yeah. That, which is a, really a straw man argument, but um, happens all the time. People will accuse God if a, if a little baby dies. Well, God obviously doesn't love, the, isn't in control of the world because 
he wouldn't want a little baby to die. Is that a true statement? No, it's not a true statement. That's looking at things from our vantage point and from our value system, not from God. What about uh, when Peter showed up at the door after being released from prison? Acts 12, 14. Acts 12, 14, recognize, recognizing Peter's voice, her joy, or inner joy, she did not open the gate, but ran and reported to Peter uh, that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind, but she kept insisting it was so. They kept saying, it is his angel. Now, the author of this study, I think, is taking a little bit of liberty. That might not be exactly what uh, what Dr. Luke, or what Dr. Luke records, uh, might not be exactly what was intended by the statement. What, is, what does the word angelos mean? Messenger. That verse can be, and we'll get to it in, uh, as we're preaching through Acts, we'll get to it in a few weeks. Um, that, that may mean they were saying, it's not Peter, but somebody he sent, rather than an angel. Most interpret it that, there, that this is a statement of a guardian angel, but I don't think that necessarily we can, we can say that. We're always being protected by God, sometimes by angels, sometimes by other, other means, but God's always there protecting us. Well. We're, we're told we're not to do that, and I think that's one reason God keeps the separation. Um, the, the, the veil between the physical and the spiritual world um, closed most of the time. But that's a common thing anyway in, uh, in the Christian circles. Yeah, grow up in a Catholic household and see what you do. Yeah, angels are are up there with other other beings to pray to. But they're, they're not. They shouldn't be. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's sacrilege to do that. In addition, the Bible shows angels being messengers of his word. Scripture says that even the law of Moses was given through angels. Now, this, this, this interpretation of this verse has caused a lot of frustration for some folks. Acts 7.53. Where did I get that verse from? Angelic, angelic messengers, but my notes are going the wrong way. Did I? Did I go too far? Acts 7.53, there you go. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. In this uh, passage here, we have this idea, or we have this declaration that angels assisted in the giving of the law. When we go back to Exodus and we look at the delivery of the law to Moses, how do you see any... When you look at the, at the account of the giving of the law in Exodus, do you see mention of angels? No. So. When it's declared here that you've rejected the law that was given through angels, how do you interpret that? There's been a lot of ways to look at this. There's been a lot of some confusion in it. Mm-hmm. 
Well, th that's one of the that's one of the good ways to interpret it. But I think we also have the ability to see in this text, as, as Stephen is is giving this beautiful sermon uh, before he's stoned, we have the realization that Moses, like us, has angels taking care of him. How long was Moses gone when he first received the law? Forty days. Yeah. He was being cared for, we believe, by angels. So you can actually address this statement in two different ways. That you can use... This is one of the problems we have with translating from one language to another. And then assuming that every use of that particular word is the way it's translated in some place. Engelos, the, the Greek root word here, means messenger. So, is he saying Moses as the messenger of God? Or is he saying Moses was, was protected or cared for or whatever by angels? The grammar allows you to have both. Which one fits with what we know? Actually, both do. So, kind of end up, end up not being able to advance the ball much with this. Another time we see God using uh, angels to give his revelation was with the birth of John the baptizer and Jesus. Luke chapter 1 reveals, uh, an angel reveals to Zechariah, the father of John the baptizer, that his son would be born and they would call his name John. Around the same time, uh, the angel Gabriel was sent to share with Mary that she would soon give birth and that the the baby would be the Son of God. God sent angels to prepare people. In Luke 2, we see God sending angels to prepare people for these events. In the book of, An of Daniel, we see an angel delivering a message. In Daniel 10, Daniel has been praying for two weeks that God would deliver his people from the rule of Babylon, Babylon and send them back to their land. And at the end of the two weeks, an angel appeared to him in prophecy, with a prophecy about the future of Israel. We can be sure when God is speaking to us through the Bible, sermons or through other people, angels are often involved, even though we don't see them. I would love to be able to know how that works. I think I'd be terrified to see it. But just take, for example, this morning. What is God doing through angels to protect us and the equipment and all of that? Because you know, when we're effective for Jesus, Satan is going after us. We've seen that. We've experienced that. And so when Satan's going after us and the angels are protecting us, what actually happens? Are there some spiritual sword fights going around us that we don't see? First of all, you, it, we, we struggle to understand the, the dimensional differences between the spirit world and the, and the physical world. How it can be happening around us and not see it and feel it. But I do know that sometimes in some places you can feel the spirit world. My first trip to Haiti, we went to where one of our churches is planted on an old voodoo burial ground. I want you to know the battle still rages there. You could feel it. I think I even smelled it. I've never felt the, the presence of the spiritual world as strong as it was in that place. And I want you to know I'm not going back to that. It's not on purpose. Well, I think it's a great symbol. I think it's a great symbol. Look, we conquered voodoo. Well, it's not my church. <laughs> and you, what you got to recognize, the, the Haitian people are way more 
in tune to the spiritual world than we are. We in the West are not in tune to the spiritual world at all. The Haitian world? Who doggies? They big time are. They, I don't know if God makes them see it more, or if it's just an experience more, or what. I, I don't understand why it's different, but it truly is different. You need something out of me? In, in you're tired, you're just looking at me like, oh. Proof of angels. Do we have proof that angels exist? Well, I gave you some, some biblical narrative on it, yeah. Yeah, in, in some places where they're really in tune to it, they see that and, and recognize it. And, uh, and we don't. Interestingly, the Bible is not the only resource that teaches us about, uh, about angels. Before the Bible was even created, a belief in angels already existed. Ancient ruins show us that virtually all ancient societies believed in angels. Now, I would argue they believed in some sort of spiritual beings, whether they were God's angels or demons or what you want to call them. That, that's a different study, but... Ancient Egypt, ancient Phoenicia, ancient Babylon all have figures of winged people, winged animals, and combinations of them throughout their ruins. So the pictures, the, the descriptions we have in Scripture of angels, of four and six winged uh, creatures, um, are not just in societies that have had the Bible. One specific ancient ruin we would consider to give us a lot of good information is that of ancient Babylon, which lies relatively close to where we believe the Garden of Eden was located. Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, God kicked them out of the Garden of Eden so they couldn't eat of the Tree of Life and live forever in their sin. But what is interesting is that, the, that God placed a cherub in front of the garden to guard the way to, to the tree, Genesis 3.24. He drove out man, and at the east of the garden he placed the cherubim, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to, uh, to guard the way of the tree of life. What has happened subsequent to... Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden that makes the Garden of Eden being between the Tigris and the Euphrates and so forth difficult for us to find. Flood, correct. And what in the flood caused that to be a problem for us? Certainly did. What's the word we use? Pangea. Remember the earth, we believe, or I believe that the earth was, was one land mass and the, the tectonic plate shift caused by the, by the hydraulic forces of the flood gave us what we now have as our seven continents. The description of the Garden of Eden contains four rivers, two of which we don't know where they are. Part of the other... Another part of the problem is more ri uh, rivers, there are more rivers than just those two with that name. Or it's possible. That there are. So it may be possible that the Garden of Eden is not located in, uh, in the Babylon area. I believe it is. I believe it's still there. I believe there's still a cherubim guarding it and a flaming sword. We have no record in Scripture of God doing anything to remove it. In fact, Genesis 3.24 tells us He placed a guard there. For what purpose? If He was going to remove it, He didn't need a guard. So why can't we find it? Because God has hidden it. 
way back in high school, I remember watching a, a movie called Shangri-La, where going through a mountain pass, they come into this paradise area. And I've always thought, you know, it's just, that's just a fictional thing, but I've always thought, that's the perfect ex ex explanation for what God has done to, uh, to Eden. It's still there. It's still on the earth. It's just God has protected it. In, in, kind of like he's protected Santa in the North. Sorry. That was a great series. Ezekiel 1.10 As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side, and the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. What do angels look like? All right. She wants me to pray. I'm, I'm getting mental telepathy. She's saying, she is saying in her brainwave, shut up and pray. I got it. Father, thank you for the blessings you give us and even giving us solutions to problems that are easily dealt with. Thank you, Father. Give us a great uh, rest of the, of the service that you might be honored. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.